All right, let's turn to number 14. Together, number 14. This is my father's world. Well, you, uh, you men know that you always need to be prepared to preach a message because you never know when uh, my voice is going to leave and I might have to call one morning and ask somebody to take the pulpit for me. Um, I remember uh, pastors before that I had that have been mentors and stuff that um, they've said things of that nature that you, you always need to be ready with a message because you might get called on to preach and you want to be able to step in and be able to do that. So one of you may need to be ready to preach a message tonight. Brother Dick, are you ready? No, <laughs> he says, no. <laughs> he says, uh-uh. Uh, my voice might make this morning. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, I want to, though, as we begin uh, to pray, I want to pray before we start and remember some of those things um, that we were sharing from testimonies and stuff this morning. And um, I praise the Lord that each one of us are challenged in the area of submission not just the ladies in the submission to their husbands, but us men in submission to the Lord and submission to those leaders that are over us. We all struggle with it. So Jancy was sharing, you know, her struggle with the submission with her husband. And, and finally, you know, even though he drug her in the car and she was still kicking a little, <laughs> uh, doing uh, those things that we don't feel like we should do and, and how the Lord can honor that and honored her obedience in that this week and gave her that good week. And I think he wanted to, to bring that around for her to reflect again on that submission to him and what that does in, in your life. And praise the Lord for that. I thank the Lord. And thinking of these two 
young girls that Shannon shared about too and, and uh, their need for the Lord. They need the Lord. Uh, the fellow that Shan, uh, uh, Sandy had shared about out at Garvin's that uh, needs the Lord. Um, just so many things, so many people that we're reaching that um, if we can reach them and bring them in and that they can experience what we've experienced in our salvation. So let's pray together for them and as we start the message. Um, Father, we thank you for our testimony time here, Lord, how you encourage our heart, Lord, from every one of the saints, Father, that you've allowed to get up here, Lord, from our military veterans, Lord, that we have here in the room, Brother Dick, Lord, I thank you for him, I thank you for his heart, for you, for all these years, Lord, that he's been serving you, and thank you for the example that he is in my life, and I thank you, Lord, for what he's done for this country in the time that he served. Father, I want to thank you for uh, Tim Baxter, too, Lord, for the, the work that he did and some of the uh, work that he was about, Lord, in the military and things that he can't share, Lord, that were top secret things. And I, I thank you for his uh, respect to the military and those things in that area too, Lord, because he could share many things that he ought not to. And I thank you that he doesn't, uh, but that he had a special place there for us. Lord, and I want to pray specifically for his salvation this morning, Lord. And I pray and I know that through his wife here, as she becomes more and more and more obedient, Lord, to you in every area of our life. That as he begins to see those changes and those things, Lord, those are the things that can bring him. Father, use Jancy in a mighty way, Lord, as she serves you to change his life. Father, we pray for the salvation of his soul. Lord, we pray for this man out at Garvin's that Sandy had an opportunity to, to share with this week. And Lord, that you would uh, right now, by means of your spirit, just come upon his heart, Lord, where he is. Allow him to see his need for you. Allow him to reflect on that beautiful hymn again, Amazing Grace. Allow him to see the wretch that he is and how you saved him. You can save him, Lord. We just lift him before you. Lord, these two young ladies, Lord, that uh, Shannon has been working with this last week, Lord, allow them to show, show them, Lord, that you are the God that provides in, in life, Lord, that the means through which these things have come this week have been by your hand. Allow them to be able to see it, Lord. Allow them to be able to praise you. Allow Shannon to be able to reach out to them further, Lord, in that way. And we thank you for, for Paul Sapp, too, and the, the influence that he was in their lives. And, Lord, even his caring spirit to call later to check up on one of them to see how they were doing, oh, Lord, I... Thank you for that. Father, I think of Humberto Flores, too, across the street as he's in his room this morning. Lord, that you'd get a hold of his heart, that you'd bind Satan, Lord, bind the alcohol that drives him and that he's become a servant too, Lord. Pray that you'd be with him, Lord. And Henry, Lord, across the alley, the back way here too, Lord, be with him, Lord. The same thing has got a hold of him. Change him, Lord. And Father, I ask that you'd be with us in this time of teaching, Lord, that you would open our hearts up to the, your word, Lord, the truth behind it, Lord, that you'd be with my uh, words and my voice to be able to deliver it, Lord. Pray for our brother Harlan, Lord, too, that isn't in here this morning. I don't know where he is. I need to give him a call, Lord. He's generally here on time. Pray that you'd be with him where he needs you this morning. Harlow, Lord, too. Father, the others that aren't here that have been coming, Lord, we Pray that you be with them, the Anderson family, Lord, as they travel, be with them and give them safety and be with our brother Tom there in, in Denver. Lord, we thank you for folks that are there, uh, Grandpa Allen and Marcia, being able to be there and serve you, Lord, and help us, Lord. We thank you for that. Father, we give you this time this morning and, and be with us in a mighty way. Help us to be in good spirits this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, some of you will be glad to know that we have moved this morning out of the book of Jude. We have. But we are going to have, Lord willing, with my voice, the very last message to the book of Jude this evening. Uh, so this morning, we're actually going to be in uh, Joshua chapter number 5. So if you go in the Old Testament to Joshua, 
um, and open up there. I did kind of title this message a different title than I would normally title something, and after I titled it that, I asked myself a few times, should I change the name? Should I change the name? And the Lord kept the same title, and if you see from your uh, bulletin that it is, uh, uh, the message this morning is titled, The Hill of Foreskins, and just something that's a little different, but I'll try and get into our message, and you'll kind of have a little bit more understanding of what exactly that's going to be. Um, to kind of bring us where uh, <clears throat> we need to be to understand where we are in Joshua 5. There is so much history, and I have, I have given us a little bit of it in some messages that I've preached in the past or in dealings and talking. Um, but the children of Israel have been on a long trip from the place of Egypt all the way into the promised land. And as we come to chapter 5 in Joshua, they actually have made entrance into the promised land. But they have gone and been in that area where they had to leave Egypt. And Egypt was a symbol of the world. And they came out of the world. And then they came to the Red Sea, didn't they? And the Red Sea was a representation of salvation in their lives. And they had to cross the Red Sea. They had nowhere to go, did they? They, they were covered on both sides. And they had the, the uh, Pharaoh and his army that was behind. And the only where they, place they could go would be across the sea. And they were at wit's end, didn't know what they were going to do. And the mighty God of Israel parted that Red Sea that they could come through. But that's a picture of salvation. That they came out of Egypt and that they entered in to the God of Israel. And then they had many years, didn't they, of wandering. Forty years of wandering in the uh, desert there before they were able to get into the place in position to cross the Jordan River. And that Jordan, if you remember from, I, I think I talked about a little bit uh, with memorial stones and then back when we looked at manna, that the Jordan represents dying to yourself and rising up to Jesus in your life. It's that point in time where you said, I'm going to die to who I am and let God reign in my life how He ought to reign. And right after they cross, we find them as they're in the land of promise. That land flowing with milk and honey. That sweet land. You recall the 12 spies that had gone up into the land and when they came back, they got some of the fruit and they had to carry that fruit on a pole between two of them because it was so great that they couldn't carry it alone. This is the land in which they've now entered into. Under Joshua, a new leader. It had been Moses, but Moses died on Mount Nebo. Now he, Joshua, is going to lead the captain of the Lord's Israel, is going to move into the promised land. And as they do, and as they cross, before they even face the first battle, we find them on a hill in a place, Gilgal. But we're going to see that they actually called that place the hill of foreskins. And why was it called that in their life? Well, if you're here at uh, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1, we're going to read through, uh, probably maybe through about verse 12 or just a little shy of that. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more, 
because of the children of Israel. And last week I mentioned just a little bit about Rahab and how even Rahab and Jericho knew of the things that had happened and there was fear of these people in the land for Israel coming through. And at that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee a sharp knife, or sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him a sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were till all the people that which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land which the Lord sware unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Well, we see the word circumcision, and we talked about circumcision in our Thursday night a little bit. We've talked about it in our Wednesday night a little bit this last week. But I want to talk about circumcision a little bit and then come back into this passage and look at some of the things that are here. But circumcision began with the patriarch Abraham. And when he was circumcised, it was a sign of a covenant that God was making with him, Abraham, and which would soon to be a nation. So we looked also at the Abrahamic covenant on Thursday night in our study, a couple weeks past and this week too. But that covenant that God made with Abraham, the sign of it was circumcision, that he was going to make a great nation. And you know that this sign and this covenant that God makes here with Abraham was the beginning of the nation Israel. That was where the nation began, was the covenant that God made with Abraham. And we know with this covenant of circumcision, part of it was outward and part of it was inward. And who here does not know what circumcision means or what, what circumcision is of the flesh? Who doesn't know? Okay, we've got some hands that are... I'm going to let your folks deliver that to you at home. I, I'm going to give a little bit, but I want to give the, the whole thing of what circumcision is. But it's an important thing to know what the circumcision of the, of the flesh is. But we know that it takes place of males, not the females. But I don't want to let you ladies off the hook to think that you're not a part of the circumcision because the males represented the nation. They represented the family. So the females entered into the covenant of God in circumcision as well when the males were circumcised. And we know that that was the outward flesh, taking off of the flesh of the male. But there was a, the outward significance of this, we have to understand. 
God was saying that he was going to make a nation that was different, separate from all other nations. And with that nation, he was going to make his name known to all other nations. But they needed to be separate from those that went before them. And not all those nations, we don't even see circumcision before this point in time. With Abraham, that's where circumcision began, where the males would be circumcised to make them different than all those other nations that were before them. So there was the outward sign as they saw the circumcision of the flesh, that they knew that they were a different people. They weren't a part of the same group of people. But there was a greater sign of circumcision, and that was what it truly meant inward, the inward circumcision of the heart. And it meant with Israel being separate from all other nations. They were going to be separate from the sins of the other nations. They weren't going to be like those other nations as they come in here in Joshua's time. They're not going to be like those other nations is what God is saying. That basically the circumcision was the cutting away of the skin of the male and discarding it but the inward circumcision of our heart is what it meant inwardly to Israel as well. The cutting away of sin from the heart and discarding it from our life. So circumcision, and we know, and we can ask ourselves, is circumcision for today? Well, circumcision of the flesh today, you can be circumcised or you do not have to be circumcised. Either way, people pick either side of the place to be. I think there's some medical things in which those that are circumcised, there's a cleaner lifestyle according to what doctors say. So many people enter into the circumcision of the flesh in our day, in our time. We even know in Israel's time, in the New Testament time, the Lord Jesus Christ, followed in circumcision, didn't he? We looked at it Wednesday. He followed in obedience to circumcision, even though he didn't need to represent all that that represented outwardly, did he? Or inwardly, because he was altogether holy, separate from sinners, because he wasn't a sinner, was he? But he followed in so that he could, like I think Tina said, fulfill all righteousness. She told us that on Wednesday. And that is right. But for us now, we don't have to be circumcised to be a part of God's family and the outward circumcision. But the circumcision for us today is that circumcision of the heart. And I want to read a little bit from Colossians over in the New Testament. And then we're going to come right back here to... Uh, Joshua, so if you keep your place there. Colossians chapter 2, starting right in verse 11. It says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. I think that beginning of that circumcision begins when we come to know the Lord as our Savior, doesn't it? He circumcises us unto him. But I think there's a, an additional part that we see as we go on into chapter 3 with the circumcision. Starting in verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
Set your affections on things above and not things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now I want you to notify, notice this next word. It says mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And it gives us a list of what those are. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, and which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also put off all those, put off all these, and it gives it additionals, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that, seeing that ye have, but you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that, was cre that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all. And in all, and we know that we all can become a part of the circumcision. We all can become a part of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. But as our heart is circumcised, God says that we must mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. We must sever some ties in our life with the world. As we go back to Joshua, I want to look at the new generation that has arisen here, that is going to follow in what circumcision meant at the beginning for Abraham. It means the same for them right here on the hill of foreskins. But I want you to notice this. This is an important element for us to see. They have already crossed the Jordan River before the circumcision takes place. Last Christmas, our Christmas service that we had on our morning service, it would have been the 23rd of December. And I remember that because that's Harlan's birthday. It's Harlan's birthday. I had, I challenged the church, many of us, we came forward, we held hands, and we prayed together, and we made a commitment that we were going to die to the old man, and we were going to live to the new man in our life. Who remembers that? Does anybody remember doing that? How have you done? Over the last year, it's almost been. How have we done crucifying ourselves in living to Jesus? Saying, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, they crossed that same area, didn't they? They said in their heart and their mind that we are going to live for you, Christ, God, God of Israel. We're living for you, and we're going to die to ourself. But something had to happen before they actually made their move into the land, before they could begin to tackle Jericho and Ai and on. And Joshua takes time right here to sharpen the knife. Did you catch that? So verse 2 at that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins, the title to our message. I don't think Joshua just sharpened his own knife, but there were many knives that were sharpened that day in order to complete the process of the circumcision because the number of Israel was great. There was many men in Israel. 
And they take the time to sharpen the knives. And this hill gets the name for just what took place there, the hill of foreskins. And I think if you think about the number of people that were in Israel at the time, How many was it that came out of Egypt, roughly? Shelley, I know you're going to say back there. What were you going to say? Close to 600,000 or more. That Israel that came out of Egypt when they left Egypt. Now, many of them died in the wilderness time, but been replaced by the other generation. So I think it's just as big, just as great of Israel as it was in that time. So now you take the men in Israel and you circumcise every one of those men or those men that would reach that circumcision time. And there was a great hill of the foreskins. Not just a little mound but a great hill of foreskins. And you know, if, if I would have been Jericho, if I would have been AI, that would have been the opportune time to launch your attack back at Israel because the men were unprepared for battle. They were still undergoing healing process weren't they? They were. But God knew the direction and what was the heart. We saw the heart of those people. There was a fear, wasn't there? They were afraid of what was going to happen, what was coming. The God of Israel, we can see Him coming. He's coming. He's entering into His land that He promised Abraham, a great nation. Here they come. Well, this is what I began to ask myself when I was reading this. And that's why the Lord prompted my heart to, to teach on this. Is I began to ask myself as I was reading it after we stood up together last December. And we made that commitment to cross the Jordan River and to die to ourselves and live for the Lord. Did I spend some time on Gilgal? And did I sharpen my knife? And I I take time to begin to cut the sin away from my heart and be really prepared to go into the land that God had promised us. You see, the hill of foreskins is an emblem for us or a symbol of all the world's carnal affections are sin. So I ask, have you begun a heel of foreskins in your life? God, if you haven't, God's brought us to a point where He wants us to begin the process of cutting the sin away in our life. Have you noticed that we've had lots of messages I think the Lord's been bringing us about cutting sin away from our life, about getting rid of the old person that we were and being who God wants us to be in the new life, right? Like Jancy testified, I didn't want to be submissive. I didn't want to go to Billings. That's a part of the foreskin, isn't it? God's saying, I want you to cut that unsubmissive heart out of your life, and you need to separate it from you and put it on the hill of foreskins. He's calling us to that spot. This morning. And I think every one of us have that have that peace of not wanting to be submissive. God's calling us, cut it, sharpen the knife. You see, it didn't just happen. 
with Joshua, God tells him, Joshua, make the sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel a second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives. Joshua had to do it, didn't he? You have got to sharpen the knife in your life. And you've got to take your heart. With Jesus Christ being your Savior, He's already there. You're already a part of the circumcision, but He's calling you to cut away the remaining foreskin in your life and discard it on the hill in Gilgal and place it there. I remember growing up as a boy and my grandpa was a barber and we'd go and we'd, I loved, I, I loved the time and I, I can see it with Kyler anyway, I don't know if Caleb's like that. Caleb hates haircuts, I give the boys haircuts, but that time when you sit in the chair and grandpa would pump it up a little bit because you were a little fella, right? He had to pump you up far enough so you're high enough to be where he could uh, begin to work on you. And he'd shave and I, he'd start with the, the, the scissors and he'd, and he'd trim and then I loved it when he, when he went to the, I don't know, the, the razor, I guess if you call it the um, electric. Because you could just sit there and as he was shaving your neck and he was going around your ears, oh, it was just the vibration from it. Oh, it just, I mean, it was like heaven. It was just a little piece of heaven just getting your haircut. I love that. I love that. I wish I could get a haircut every day. But that wasn't the end of his process. I don't know if any of you have been to a barber like this, though, but my grandpa was the old, the old school barber. Well, then he, he had this little, uh, it, it had a, uh, I don't know what you call it. Maybe one of you might know what it is. But it had a, a wood handle. And then it had like, uh, it looked like a broom, kind of. And he would dip this thing in to like shaving cream. And then he put that shaving cream around your ears, on your neck, and he'd lather you up. Who's had a haircut like that? Maybe somebody get a haircut like that still today. Well, then I noticed he had this, it, it was a razor blade, but it was a shave in a, you know, for a barber. It was about this long, and it kind of had just a little bit of an angle to it, but sharp. You know, and it would fold together, but he'd open it up. And he had a way that he held it in his hand, when he was operating it, I thought, man, that does, you're going to cut somebody. It doesn't look very, you know, comfortable, but he'd, he'd shave your neck then with that, with that razor. But does anybody know where that barber, did you ever watch that barber sharpen that razor? Where, what were we sharpen it on? Strap. Right on the seat, wasn't it? A strop. What was it called? Strop. A strop. Well, I would see him, and, I, and then I would go, you know, I remember being over there, we used to help him clean and stuff, but I would look at that strop on there, and it was a piece of leather, and then I'm looking at that. How did, how did that sharpen that knife? I still don't know for sure, but Grandpa would do that. He'd run that, get that sharp and ready to go. You've got to sharpen your knife this morning. God's calling each one of us to sharpen the knife, to cut away from our life. The remaining foreskin, see, you've left some of it behind. Ladies, I'm talking to you too because it applies to us because we're the circumcision of God and it's of the heart. And every one of you have a heart, don't you? You do. God's given it to you. But there's a little straggler that's there. There's some part that He's calling you to cut away this morning and put it, on the, put it on that pile, the hill of foreskins, like Joshua and the children of Israel did before they would go in to conquer the land. You've got to do it this morning. God's calling you there. You see, since last December, we've gone in, we've entered in, but we've, we've been unwilling with something. We've been unwilling we're, we're, you know what it is that you're unwilling with, don't you, right now? You're unwilling with it. It's there. God wants you to take the knife to it. But then oftentimes, you know what we do? We discard it. 
and then we think we're ready to go into battle. What did they do here? I want to start about verse 7. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their place in the camp till they were whole. Oh, this is such a vital part that we miss. I'm going to tell you this morning, if you truly sharpen the knife, if you truly do, and you truly take care of the rest of the foreskin and you cast it to the hill, there's going to be a wound. You're going to be wounded because this is something that you've been holding on to. And this is something that's been dear to you in your life. But it's something that's not good. It's a part of the world. And it's a part of the affections of the world. But as you cut it away, and if you cut it away this morning, you're going to need some time to heal from it. And notice where they healed. They abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. The camp. The camp. That was Israel. That was the, the people of God. They had to place themselves back in the camp with the people of God where they could heal together. You see, we've kind of got a camp, but it's not the camp of Israel in the same sense. We're in the dispensation of the church. We got the body of Christ. You and I, we've got the church. So as we take the foreskin and we cast it to the hill, we've got to remain in the body because we need healing. See, if you truly take care of some of those things that need to be dealt with, you might need to take time with a brother or sister to pray with. You might need some help. It hurts. It's hard. Because it's been a part of your life. Somebody's here in this fellowship that's there to aid in the healing. And I tell you, we need the healing. And I want you to think of, uh, well, you can think of circumcision if you want, or you can think of a wound that you've had. Just a simple paper cut. It hurts. That's just a little cut on your finger, isn't it? And it hurts, and it hurts for several days. Now you take this big thing that we're taking right now, the circumcision of our heart. And there's going to be a wound. There's not any of us that's going to be left unwounded. But we need each other here to heal, don't we? We need each other. That brother, that sister. It might even be, it might even be a little Terran that comes right up here to this microphone and says, I'm glad that you're here, Harlow. You know Harlow's healing. Harlow's healing because he was an alcoholic. I haven't been an alcoholic and I don't understand the cutting away of that type of foreskin. But when he has a little man tell him that he loves him and missed him, that aids in his healing, doesn't it? Helps keep him amongst the camp, amongst the group. There's somebody here 
that has to aid us in our healing. Maybe they've walked it. They've been there. But when that finger finally heals over in a few days, <coughs> Carol can kind of feel that right now, can't you, with the surgery that you had. It's getting better every day, isn't it? It's getting better. Every, you're going to be able to use it fully again. But during that time, it's hard to. It could take you way down. Low. Has you ever been low? Oftentimes, you're, we're afraid to tell one another, aren't we? We're afraid to come to our brother and sister for help when we need it. With the severing of this foreskin, you're going to need it. We need each other here. We need to be committed to one another in our local body. I looked at this word whole because God kept bringing me back to the word whole. Whole. There's got to be something. If you underline a word in your Bible or circle it, I would do it with whole. I really would. Whole. Whole. Till they were whole. To so look to see what does whole mean here? Because whole has a whole bunch of different meanings, I think. Whole. I'm thinking, okay. They're healed, they're whole, yeah. The body's whole again. They're going to be able to go and do what they need to do. But what whole really means, I think it brings a little deeper meaning. It did for me anyway. It means live. It means live. You see, we can't truly begin to serve Jehovah. We can't truly begin to serve Jesus like He's intended us to serve Him until we've been to the hill of foreskins. Because on the other side is where we make, where we've been made whole. That's really where you and I begin to live for the Lord. Do you know that? That's really where we begin to live for Him, is you've got to be at Gilgal. You've got to have dealt with the heel of foreskins. You've got to take the time to heal. But we come out whole. That's where we begin. Really, wholeheartedly, with our whole heart and our whole being and everything that we have to serve. Jehovah. See, I don't know. We're all in different walks where the children of Israel were. Some people are still in Egypt. That means some people are still in their sins. Some people are still in the world and need to come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Others of us have crossed the Red Sea just like Israel did. Representative of our salvation. We've taken a hold of the God of Israel. But you know, what did Israel then do? Wandered 40 years in the wilderness. Are we wandering or have we been wandering in the wilderness like the children of Israel did for 40 years? You see, if you look at each step, God calls us out of Egypt to cross the Red Sea, to wander, but then He brings us head on to the Jordan River where we got to make that decision. See, I think you can probably be a Christian in your life and you can be a wandering Christian. I think you can choose to stay and wander and wander and wander, but God, the song that we sang last week, Higher Ground. God wants you and I to take higher ground. You see, He wants to take us out of the wandering and He wants to move us across the Jordan where we say, Lord, Your will be done, not my will. I want to crucify myself and let Jesus live in me. But it might be that you've got to spend a, a little bit of time on the hill this morning 
Because truly, truly to serve the Lord like He wants, we've got to come out on the side of living. That's true living for God. You've seen people, I think, that have really carried on right here where they are truly living for God. They've taken care of the foreskin. Let us do it this morning. See, I don't know what it is. I want to, take, I want to have Sandy come up and begin to play for us. I've got to deal with God wants me to serve Him. He does. But to come out and truly live for Him like He wants me to, to have the power that He wants to give me in my life, your life, you've got to sharpen the knife this morning together as a body to move through, to live, truly live for Him. And you would be amazed. I think I'd be amazed at the preaching that God would have for me. The song leading He would have for Brother Kurt. The gift that you've got that He's given you. How you'll be able to use it to the fullest extent of it. He's prompting us. He's moving us. I see Grandpa's chair. And I see him sharpening the razor. Sharpen it. Let's cut it away. What is it? I want it for you to bow your heads. I want you to think of what it is. The altar's always open. We don't have much of an altar here. Hopefully, eventually, we'll have a little something built up. But it's always here that if you want to come forward, anybody could come forward. Where's God dealing with you? this morning what is it that you have let's deal with that together and then I'll close us with prayer I'm gonna take a little time and just pray Let the Lord work those things in your heart out that are there. The sharpening of the knife and the cutting away of the foreskin means that you recognize that you put it out there away from you never to take hold of again. Oh God, allow us to have the courage the heart, Lord, to do what you want us to do with that knife this morning, Lord. We know that it can only be through your power and your might that you work within us, Lord, to allow that to be happening and taking place in our life, Lord. Lord, we can be more for you than we are right now. 
Help us, Lord, to take time of healing. If, Lord, going through this process this morning and, and cutting the foreskin away, Lord, and piling it causes us to be hurt, Lord. And we need a time of healing, Lord. Allow us to be able to, to group up with our local body here, Lord, and find that healing, Lord. And allow us to be sensitive enough in, in our spirits, Lord, to see or to know if somebody's there, Lord, in their life that we need to reach out with them at this healing, Father. Help us to have the words and the comfort that we need, Lord, as we all go through the process together, Lord. And allow us, Lord, to come through and to be whole in that word, Lord, to truly live for you, Jesus. Help us to truly live for you. Not my will be done, Lord, but thy will be done in me and thy will be done in my brothers and sisters that are here, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, Lord, your will be done in our lives. Father, we just end our service time here, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. We continue to uplift those that aren't amongst us, Lord, and those that are, that are sick and those that are healing, Lord, from other things in their lives. Father, that your power and your might and your special grace would be in their hearts, in their lives, Lord, to aid them. Lord, help us to be a people that are willing to tell that person we're sitting next to, that person that we're talking to about you. Give us the courage, Lord, to do that. Help us see people, Lord, saved that we're reaching out to. And like Brother Jeff said, Lord, help us to reach those people and bring them, Lord, here. Bring them uh, to church, Lord, to grow together that they can reach people too. Father, we just end our time and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Two, th two things in ending here were Sandy Kitt.